You may have heard the phrase before, well begun is half done. Well, I can tell you that the story of Genesis isn't that. It is rather, well begun is undone, but there's hope. Well begun is undone, but there's hope. Join me this morning as we make our way through this delightful book of Genesis, the world of beginnings that reveals the goodness of God. As we do so, we're going to be looking at it in sections. And so let's look first at the section of Genesis 1 through 11, and we will see that God is good in creating all things and in saving the human race from destruction. So God is good in creating all things. Uh, We see it in chapter 1. All things were created through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, John chapter 1. And all these things are good. We see after each day, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. These are all good things that God has done in creating the universe. Of particular note is Genesis 126 and 27 is that human beings are made as a part of the goodness of God, and there is the blessing of family. You'll see in verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Uh, Human beings created as male and female, and then the blessing of family. We see that in chapter two, begin at verse 18, where everything's good, 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 but there's something in chapter two that says it's not good. It's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And so he makes the woman and then institutes the family. A man leaves father and mother, holds fast to his wife. The two become one flesh, one family. These are things that are part of God's goodness in creating all things. Human beings then become the stewards of God's creation to improve upon it. If you go to chapter 1 verse 28, God blesses them. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the creation, fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, every living thing that moves on the ground. And God says, I've given you every plant yielding seed, every tree, you'll have them for food. And to every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, everything that creeps on the ground, everything that has the breath of life, I've given green plant for food. And it was so. So the fact is that God has given human beings as stewards of his creation. And actually, this is amazing, actually to improve upon it. Look at chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Work was created before the entrance of sin into the world, which means that work is good. We are improving on God's creation as we work as stewards of God's creation. Now, God is also good, demonstrate his goodness, in setting boundaries. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. You can eat from any tree, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from it. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. God has, in his goodness, set boundaries for human beings. Of course, they don't do that, right? They eat from the tree, and so there's a mess there. But God is good at saving the human race. If you look at chapter three, verse seven, the eyes of them were opened, they knew they were naked, this is after they'd eaten of the fruit, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. I don't know if you've ever seen a fig leaf, but that's a pretty ridiculous notion to try to sew fig leaves together. They looked ridiculous, right? Human attempts to solve our problems are ridiculous. But God, chapter 3, verse 21, made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. That's a little foreshadowing of the fact that there had to be a blood sacrifice, an animal had to die in order for there to be life. 
a foreshadowing of the eternal life we would have through the death of God's Son. And in chapter 3, verse 15, we will look at this in detail in a moment, but God actually promises future salvation in the ultimate sense. He, in the curse on the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this idea of the smashing of Satan and his plans is a promise of future salvation in the ultimate sense. God is also good in keeping the human race from apparently good intentions. Now, we all would like to live a long time, and every time that we live one more day of good health, don't you want to live one more and one more and one more? There's a good intention there. And so there was a tree in the garden that was called the tree of life, that if you ate from it, you could live forever. That sounds like a good intention, but God is good in saving the human race from its apparently good intention. In fact, what he does is, verse 24 of chapter 3, he drove the man out of the garden and he placed cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Why? Because of verse 22, lest he reach out his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God wants human beings to have eternal life, but not eternal life with sin and its degradation forever. That's how good God is. God is good at keeping the family alive after a horrific murder, chapter 4. The firstborn of Adam and Eve kills the secondborn, and you could think that the light of the promise was going to go out, but God is good at preserving the family. God's good at granting long life after the curse of death. Chapter 5, you have this series of genealogies with a whole bunch of people living hundreds of years, and then they die, and they die, and they die. God's good at granting long life to people in the early stages of the human experience. And then God is good at scrubbing the world of incredible evil while still saving the human race. If you go to chapter 6, verse 5, you'll see the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Listen to this absolute. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the state at which the world had arrived. Every intention of the thoughts of human heart were only evil all the time. And so God is good at at being able to scrub the world of this incredible evil while still saving the human race. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah is the one who's tasked with building an ark and His family goes in the ark, and who is it that shuts Noah in? God is the one who closes the door to the ark, chapter 7, verse 16. And God's goodness to the human race and to the earth is found in his promises after the flood in chapter 8. Look at verse 21. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Listen to this, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Such is God's goodness to the human race and to the earth that he will providentially preserve it until the end of time. God makes a covenant with Noah And in chapter 9, despite knowing that Noah would sin, which he does, God is good then in chapter 10 at making the nations of the world. You know, we have the Olympics going on right now, and there's all this talk of all the nations are gathering together in this wonderful thing, and if only we could just have all the things together and everybody would be perfect peace and light. You know, well, human beings have tried that, and that's chapter 11 where the human race tries to find its meaning and ultimate joy 
in itself in a life apart from God, God's good at saving human beings from such global political agendas and he causes the languages of the world to be confused. You see, God is good in creating all things and then he's good even in saving the human race from destruction despite these many moments just in the early periods of human history saving them from what would cause the light of the promise to go out. If you're interested in more about Genesis 1 through 11, I gave a series of messages on that in 2022 and would encourage you to look at our website and you'll find those messages. Let's look at chapters 12 through 23. God is good in creating a nation from one man, Abraham, through which he would save the world. God is good in creating a nation from one man, Abraham, through which he would save the world. He chooses Abraham, who's known in the first part of his life as Abram, uh, through whom he would make a nation that would bless all the families of the earth. That's chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. Make your name great, so you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's God's goodness of picking a person through which he would make a nation from whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God preserves this promise, though Abraham foolishly acts in ways that would kill it. We can see it already in chapter 12, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, where Abraham is scared about Pharaoh, and so he tells Pharaoh, Sarah is my sister, not my wife, and Pharaoh is going to take her as a wife, and that would cause the light of this promise to go through Abraham to go out if Pharaoh violates Sarah. And as a result, God providentially hinders Pharaoh from acting, and the promise is preserved. God even preserves the people that are innocently part of the foolish act of Abraham. He's good to Pharaoh. This is how, God, how good God is. God has Abraham rescue Lot and the cities of the, of the region in chapter 14 so that the city of Jerusalem first appears and becomes relevant. It's known as Salem there, but it's the city of Jerusalem. So even from the earliest of times, this city becomes a place in which God has set his heart. God makes a covenant with Abraham in chapters 15 and 17. And the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. The idea of being right with God, not by any works that we do, but by simply taking God at his word and believing in his promises. God provides in chapter 22 a lamb as a substitute sacrifice for the son of Abraham, which again is a foreshadowing, isn't it, of a lamb who would be a substitute sacrifice for us all. Do you remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus? Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's good in creating a nation from one man, Abraham, through which he would save the world. This, uh, I did a series in the life of Abraham in 2019 and 20. If you're interested in more detail on those chapters, I'd encourage you to look at those messages. And now we come to chapters 24 through 36 of Genesis. God is good in preserving this family of this one man, despite the family plans to go their own way. Uh, these are going to be the stories of Isaac and Jacob. It's going to be the focus of our sermon series this fall. Uh, we're doing an overview today. Next week, we will do a, a message on the world of the patriarchs. We've got to know their world before we understand their ways. And then in two weeks' time, we will begin this series on the lives of Isaac and Jacob. Uh, so we're going to go pretty quickly through this 
uh, section this morning, but know that we're going to be going in detail through it. Through the fall, it'll lead all the way up to Christmas. So God provides a wife for Isaac in chapter 24. God preserves despite family rivalry in chapter 25. God preserves de- despite repeated family sin in chapter 26. Isaac does the same thing that his father did in lying about his wife being, not being his wife. God preserves despite lying and trickery in chapter 27. That's where Jacob fools Isaac into getting the blessing. God preserves despite Jacob going out of the land and getting tricked by his own relative, uncle Laban, in chapters 28 through 31. God preserves despite the sibling rivalry between Esau and Jacob, chapters 32 and 33. God preserves despite rotten relationships with the owners of the promised land. You see, up until now, there isn't any promised land that the people own. In fact, did you know that the only land that Abraham ever owned in the promised land is found in chapter 23, verse 20, where he buys some ground at a cave in order to bury Sarah. That's the land he's got, a place for burial. And so God preserves, uh, despite these people, uh, all of the, the problems of relationships with the people in the promised land. God blesses both his plan and the ruined plans of others. God actually blesses Esau. So in all of these ways, what's happening is God's got a plan for saving and human beings keep wanting to divert from the plan and God uses all of that still to accomplish his great purpose. How good is God? Just amazing. In chapters 35 through 50, God is good in leading the family out of the land of promise in order to keep them from disappearing so that they might re-enter the land as a nation. This is the Joseph narrative, which I spoke uh, that series back in 2011. It's still available on our website, so I'd encourage you to check it out. God uses the youngest son to save his brothers and his father, Joseph. God shows why the family needed to leave the land, promised land, temporarily. Chapter 38 is a weird chapter, but the whole reason chapter 38 is there is to show this family is going crazy after sin, and they are being amalgamated into being Canaanites. They aren't going to be distinct. They aren't going to be God's people. They aren't going to be God's promise if they keep up their ways. In fact, that's even the whole message of the Old Testament, right? God's people always running away from God, and the threat is that they're just going to get glommed into, that's a Burkle phrase, amalgamated into the peoples in the region so that there's no difference between them and anybody else. That's the threat, and God is so good He preserves them. They leave. God uses injustice to reveal his goodness, the injustice of Joseph being sent into slavery. He exalts what seems impossible. Joseph's in prison and God moves him from the prison to the palace. God blesses the family into a nation. They start out as just a few score people And they end up at the end of Genesis over a million people. God uses for good what people meant for evil. Genesis 50, wonderful text here. Verses 20 and 21, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, Joseph says, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. God is good in leading these people out of the land of promise. They're they're out of the land. And they're in Egypt. 
And yet God does this in order to keep them from disappearing so that they might re-enter the land as a nation. So, God's good in creating all things and saving the human race from destruction, chapters 1 through 11. God's good in creating a nation from one man, Abraham, through which he would save the world, chapters 12 to 23. God is good in preserving the family of this one man, despite the family plans to go their own way, Genesis 24 to 36. And God is good in leading the family out of the land of promise in order to keep them from disappearing so that they might re-enter the land as a nation. Now you might say, if you have the outline in front of you, good, we're going to get done early. Not even close. <clears throat> Not even close, because I got more for you. There's some really good stuff that I want to share with you. Here's one of them. Did you know that this is a book that you can trust? And there's ways that you can know that you trust it. If it was just a manufactured book, if it was just a humanly manufactured book, there would be all kinds of problems that would be discovered later. Archaeology would find something out that you'd go, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't comport with this, and so it doesn't fit. It must have been a made-up story. And there are all kinds of old books that are that way. But the Bible is not that way, friends. And for that, I want to introduce you to something called a colophon. Oh, impress your friends and neighbors with this word this afternoon. Colophon, C-O-L-O-P-H-O-N, colophon. It helps us understand how Moses, who's the author of Genesis, came to write this book. He used a Mesopotamian plan of writing called colophons to structure and organize the book. This is, and, and this is, there, there's a, I could have, I could have put up a thousand different Mesopotamian manuscripts up here for you because it's all over Mesopotamia. This one is from what's called the Atrahasis epic that dates to the time of the patriarchs, so that's why I picked it. It's in cuneiform, which is a wedge-shaped writing that is on clay tablets, okay? Uh, this particular one is, you can see it at the British Museum in London. Um, but here's the thing I want to note for you. Do you see these things right here? So the, 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 there's the writing and then there's these things and then there's some writing here and then there's a little line here that separates it and then there's some more writing over here. And the, this tablet, by the way, is about the size of a half a page of paper, okay? If you want, five by seven, maybe six by eight, something like that, okay? But this, this story, this is kind of a crazy story, this, this is a Babylonian story that tells about how the gods created the world, how human beings were alienated from the gods, and how God destroyed the world with a flood. Nothing related to anything real, right? <laughs> kind of an interesting story. But what I want to point out isn't the story, but the form of writing. What happens is that when they get to the end of a section, they have what's called a colophon, just repeated words that kind of describe for you, this is where we're at in the story, okay? And did you know that Moses used colophons in the construction of the book of Genesis? Look at it. It's using this phrase, these are the generations of, and it occurs 11 times in the book of Genesis. Now, some scholars say that this colophon is something that introduces the material that follows it. Other people say it's a conclusion statement. It's a statement that concludes what goes before it. Uh, it really doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's a way in which Moses used a Babylonian form, which was current at the time, to construct the first 36 chapters of the book. I happen to believe that it is a description of the material that comes before it. So, for example, chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, what happened before it. These are the generations of Adam, of Noah, sons of Noah, Shem, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Esau, and Jacob. Now, here's what's fascinating to me, especially when you understand it the way I do, that it 
informs the material before it is that there's none of that repeated phrase from chapter 37 through the end of the book. Did you ever ask yourself the question, why? It's always a good question to ask. Why is Genesis 1 through 36 filled with these colophons and then there's none of them after it? Because chapters 1 through 36 are all about God's people's relationship to Mesopotamia. And chapters 37 to 50 are all about God's relationship of his relationship of God's people to Egypt. Egypt didn't use colophons. So what Moses is doing is he's taking material that he has received and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, putting it together in ways that connect with exactly the kind of writing that was going on at the time in both places, both Mesopotamia and in Egypt. Is that cool? I don't know, but you should be really excited at the fact that when you're holding the Bible in your hands, it's something that is not just the words of man, but the very word of God. Now, <clears throat> there's a second thing I want to share with you. The reality, the, the threat, the reality, the fear and anticipation of death in Genesis. Um, <clears throat> It starts out so good. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the word death runs all through this book. Think, for example, at the threat of death in Genesis. Whoops. Uh, Genesis 2.17, God says, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat, for in that day you will eat of it, you will surely die. And when the serpent appears to Eve... She misquotes God's word. That's always trouble, right? But she gets part of it right. God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. That part she got right. Neither shall you touch it. Not right. Lest you die, that's right, okay? So this idea of the threat of death. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. The threat of death is there in Genesis from the beginning. So what do they do? They eat from the fruit, and then we find the reality of death in Genesis. Look at before the flood. You have this table of these ancient men, and they all live hundreds of years, but here's the phrase that occurs in every instance but one, and there's a reason for the one of Enoch that I won't go into, but in every other case, it is, they lived a long time, and he died, 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 and he died. And then during the flood, you have these words of the reality of death. Genesis 6, 17, everything on the earth shall die. Genesis 7, 21, all flesh died. 7, 22, everything on the dry ground died. Chapter 9, 29, all the days of Noah were 950 years, <clears throat> and he died. One of the reasons why I believe that the flood was universal is this universal language. Everything dot will die. All flesh died. Everything died. Noah eventually died. It's the reality of death in Genesis. And then post-flood, we got a whole bunch of passages here. Uh, early patriarchs, Haran died, Terah died, Sarah died, Abraham died, Ishmael died, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died, Rachel died, Isaac died. And then it goes on, Esau's family, Bella died, Jobab died, Husham died, Hadad died, Samaya, Samla died, Shual died, Ben-Hanan died, the wife of Judah died, Ur and Onan died, Rachel died died, and then there's this text that Jacob gave before he gave this command, and he died. And then there is this fear and anticipation of death. Early on, there's a fear and anticipation of death. Lot 
says after Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed, please, I need to go to a city because otherwise I'll, I can't escape to the hills. Uh, uh, disaster will overtake me and I die of fear and anticipation of death. Um, Abimelech, who's actually a guy who wants to live and he finds out that he almost did something wrong to Sarah, he says, if you don't return, God says to her, God says to him, if you don't return her, no, you will surely die. Esau, he comes in from the field, Jacob's cooking the soup, you know, and Esau says, give me it to me. I don't care about my birthright. I'm dying here, right? Genesis 26, you got the same story, second verse. Isaac lies about his wife. And Abimelech says, why'd you do that? And Isaac says, well, I, I thought I'd die because I thought you'd kill me. This fear and anticipation of death. Isaac says to Esau, go out and prepare some game because I... I want to bless you before I die. Rebecca overhears it. And so she quotes Isaac to Jacob. You know, he's going to, he wants to give a blessing before he dies. And she and Jacob come up with this elaborate scheme to deceive Isaac. And then Rachel, after she's married to Jacob, she doesn't have children. She goes to Jacob and I imagine she grabs him by the lapels and says, give me children or I'll die. <laughs> sense of fear and anticipation of death. And then there's a fear and anticipation of death in the middle of Genesis as well. Um, Jacob is worried about Esau killing him and his family, and he says to Esau, when Esau says, well, go, come with me, he says, nah, the flocks are tired and the children, blah, blah, blah. We don't, wanna, we don't want them to die. Judah does not give a third son to Tamar because he's like, well, the first two have died as her husband. I'm not going to give her the third one. And then uh, Jacob says to his boys, hey, I heard there's grain for sale in Egypt. Go down there so that we can live and not die. And then Joseph says, bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you won't die. And Judah says to his father, send Benjamin with me. We'll arise and go that we may live and not die. And then the cup is found in Benjamin's sack. And whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And they say, we, the boy can't leave his father. If he should leave his father, his father would die. As soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And Jacob says in Genesis 45, and he finds out that Joseph is still alive, he says, I'll go and see him before I die. The fear and anticipation of death is in the middle of Genesis. And then it's in the end of Genesis as well. Uh, Joseph, Jacob says to Joseph, let me die since I've seen your face and know that you're alive. The Egyptians come to Joseph and they're, they're starving. They say to Joseph, because of the famine, give, give us this food. Why should we die before your eyes? And they sell all their land to Pharaoh. Uh, and then uh, Jacob says to Joseph in Ch Genesis 48, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. Genesis 50 verse 5, Father made me swear I'm about to die in my tomb that I've hewed out. There you will bury me. And then in chapter 50 verse 24, Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you see how this idea of death, the threat, the reality, and the fear and anticipation of death runs all through this book of beginnings so that we come to the last verse in the book of Genesis the last verse of the book of Genesis, so Joseph died. They embalmed him and put him in a coffin. This is the sad last verse of the book. So, beginning, well begun is undone, but there's hope. Let me point the hope out to you. You remember Genesis 3.15? I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
the offspring of the woman is going to smash the head of the serpent. And I believe that Paul may well have had this in mind when he wrote 1 Corinthians 15 to the people at Corinth. Notice how he uses the words dying. Christ died. He was buried. That's death. He took a death for us. By a man came death, as in Adam, all die. That's death. But notice the hope. He was raised on the third day. Christ raised from the dead. In Christ shall all be made alive. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is going to die at the hands of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins, and Satan was crushed at the cross. But you know what? That wasn't just the end of it. Christ was buried, and he rose again on the third day, and so that extended the crushing of Satan in the life of Christ. He was ascended into heaven, and that extended the crushing of Satan in the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, and he is coming again for all his own. As in Christ, all will be made alive. We'll have new life forever. Satan is crushed finally and forever. What a beautiful gospel this is. And you might say, oh yeah, I know that. No, you don't. I will tell you this on the authority of God's word. None of us comprehend the glory and perfection of the gospel. None of us do. You might say, oh yeah, I know it. I understand it. No, you don't. No, you don't. We cannot conceive of what God has done in reconciling us to himself through the blood of his son, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his coming again for his own where he will be done with death forever. You know, people recognize that there's a problem out there. People recognize that there's a problem. They don't know what it is sometimes, but they recognize that there's a problem. And so sometimes people recognize the problem as, I have anxiety. And so they seek all kinds of ways to relieve their anxiety. Some people say, I just don't have enough money. And they relieve all of the, they think that the problems will be relieved by a money issue. Or they think that there's injustice in the world and that the answer to the problem, my problem is, if all the injustice in the world is resolved. And some people say, I think my problem is, I don't know or I think I'm a different gender than I have uh, been assigned at birth. And the answer is going to be by solving that problem. And some people say that the problem is that I wish I was married. If only I was married, I would have a resolution to the anxieties of my soul. And other people say, if only I didn't have the spouse I have, I would have the problems resolved. Or if they were to change, then everything would be right. And some people say, if I just got enough approval from other people, or if I could be popular, if I could be wonderfully happy, if I could maybe take this drug to alter my consciousness so that I could really be tuned in with the universe, then I'll be satisfied. And Christians say, you know what? I know the gospel, but, and we have all kinds of things that we put in the place of this glory that's revealed in Genesis. We do not know the gospel. We think we do, but we don't know the gospel. Other people think, well, you know, if I could only have enough time on my phone, then it'll be fine. Really? If only I could find my satisfaction in pornography or other kinds of diversions, anything from trivial hobbies to the worst of the world of fantasy. If only I could get the next level of my video game, then I'll be fulfilled and happy. 
There's a thousand different ways we find substitutes for the glory of this message, friends. As in Adam, all die in Christ. All will be made alive. My message to you, dear ones, whether you've put your faith and hope in Christ or you never have, is that you would see a glory in this gospel that would transform your life from right now on all the way to glory. You would say, you know what? I'm done with the foolishness of lesser things. And I'm throwing my life, my hope on Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Heavenly Father, we pray that we'd see your goodness imprinted all over the book of Genesis where the promise looks like it's going to die and you even use the ugliness of human sin to accomplish your divine purposes. Help us to preach the gospel to ourselves every day to recognize that we haven't even come within a, an inch. We haven't come within a mile. We haven't come within an infinity of, of, the, of, of just the surface of the glories of the gospel. Help us to be done with lesser things and to say, Lord, forgive me of the ways in which I have not treasured this good, good news of your goodness to us. That you not only identify the problem, the problem is sin, you've given us the solution. The solution is faith in Christ, your son, who died for our sins, was buried and he rose from the dead. Help us so to treasure that, that it would change how we look at everything. Our money, our relationships, our power dynamics, our work. It would change how we spend our time. It would change everything about us. By the power of your spirit, we pray it. In Jesus' name, amen.